When the Moon Was Ours Written by Anna Marie McLemore Performed by Raviv Ullman and Bailey Carr Sea of Clouds As far as he knew, she had come from the water. But even about that, he couldn't be sure. It didn't matter how many nights they'd met on the untilled land between their houses. The last farm didn't rotate its crops and strip the soil until nothing but wild grasses would grow. It didn't matter how many stories he and Miel had told each other when they could not sleep. Him passing on his mother's fables of moon bears that aided lost travelers. Miel making up tales about his moon lamps falling in love with stars. Sam didn't know any more than anyone else about where she'd come from before he found her in the brush field. She seemed to have been made of water one minute, and the next became a girl. Someday, he and Miel would be nothing but a fairy tale. When they were gone from this town, no one would remember the exact brown of Miel's eyes, or the way she spiced Ricardo Rojo with cloves, or even that Sam and his mother were Pakistani. At best, they would remember a dark-eyed girl, and a boy whose family had come from somewhere else. They would remember only that Miel and Sam had been called Honey and Moon, a girl and a boy woven into the folklore of this place. This is the story that mothers would tell their children. There once was a very old water tower. Rust had turned its metal such a deep orange that the whole tank looked like a pumpkin, an enormous copy of the fruit that grew in the fields where it cast its shadow. No one tended this water tower anymore, not since a few strikes from a summer of lightning storms left it leaning to one side as though it were tired and slouching. Years ago, they had filled it from the river, but now rust and minerals choked the pipes. When they opened the valve at the base of the tower, nothing more than a few drops trickled out. The bolts and sheeting looked weak enough that one autumn windstorm might crumble the whole thing. So the town decided that they would build a new water tower, and that the old one would come down. But the only way to drain it would be to tip it over like a cup. They would have to be ready for the whole tower to crash to the ground. All that rusted metal, those thousands of gallons of dirty, rushing water spilling out over the land. For the fall, they chose the side of the tower where a field of brush was so dry, a single spark would catch and light it all. All that water, they thought, might bring a little green. From that field, they dug up wildflowers, chicory, and Indian paintbrush and larkspur, replanting them alongside the road so they would not be drowned or smashed. They feared that if they were not kind to the beautiful things that grew wild, their own farms would wither and die. Children ran through the brush fields, chasing away squirrels and young deer so that when the water tower came down, they would not be crushed. Among these children was a boy called Moon, because he was always painting lunar seas and shadows onto glass and paper, and anything he could make glow. Moon knew to keep his steps and his voice gentle, so he would not startle the rabbits, but would stir them to bound back toward their burrows. When the animals and the wildflowers were gone from the brush field, the men of the town took their axes and hammers and mallets to the base of the water tower until it fell like a tree. It arced toward the ground, its fall slow, as though it were leaning forward to touch its own shadow. When it hit, the rusted top broke off, and all that water rushed out. For a minute the water, brown as a forgotten cup of tea, hid the brush that looked like pale wheat stubble. But when it slid and spread out over the field, flattening the brittle stalks, soaking into the dry ground, everyone watching made out the shape of a small body. A girl huddled in the wet brush, her hair stuck to her face, her eyes wide and round as amber marbles. She had on a thin nightgown, which must have once been white, now stained cream by the water. But she covered herself with her arms, cowering like she was naked and looking at everyone like they were all baring their teeth. At first, a few of the mothers shrieked, wondering whose child had been left in the water tower's path. But then, they realized that they did not know this girl. She was not their daughter. 
or the daughter of any of the mothers in town. No one would come near her. The ring of those who had come to see the tower taken down widened a little more the longer they watched her. Each minute they put a little more space between her and them, more afraid of this small girl than of so much falling water and rusted metal, and she stared at them, seeming to meet all their eyes at once, her look both vicious and frightened. But the boy called Moon came forward and knelt in front of her. He took off his jacket and put it on her, talked to her in a voice soft enough that no one else could hear it. Everyone drew back, expecting her to bite him or to slash her fingernails across his face. But she looked at him and listened to him, his words stripping the feral look out of her eyes. After that day, anyone who had not been at the water tower thought she was the same as any other child, little different from the boy she was always with. But if they looked closely, they could see the hem of her skirt, always a little damp, never quite drying, no matter how much the sun warmed it. This would be the story, a neat distillation of what had happened. It would weed out all the things that did not fit. It would not mention how Miel, soaking wet and smelling of rust, screamed into her hands with everyone watching. Because everyone was watching, and she wanted to soak into the ground like the spilled water and vanish. How Sam crouched in front of her, saying, Okay, okay, keeping his words slow and level, so she would know what he meant. You can stop screaming. I hear you. I understand. And because she believed him, that he heard her, and understood, she did stop. It would leave out the part about the Bonner sisters, the four of them, from eight-year-old Chloe to three-year-old Peyton, had been there to see the water tower come down. All of them lined up so their hair looked like a forest of autumn trees. Peyton had been holding a small gray pumpkin that, in that light, looked almost blue. She had it cradled in one arm, and with the other hand was petting it like a bird. When she'd taken a step toward Miel, clutching that pumpkin, Miel's screaming turned raw and broken and Peyton startled back to her sisters. Once Sam knew about Miel's fear of pumpkins, he understood. How Peyton, treating it like it was alive, made Miel afraid not only of Peyton, but of all of them. But that part would never make it into the story. This version would also strip away the part about Sam trying to take Miel home like she was a stray cat. His mother's calm conviction as she diced potatoes that they would find a place for this girl and she was right. In less time than it took the Sagalu to finish cooking, Araceli, the woman who had seemed to Sam as much like an aunt as a neighbor, appeared at their door saying she might have space in her rented house for this girl made of water. It would not mention how Miel's hair had barely dried when the first green leaf of a rose stem broke through her small wrist. That was a different story strange and bloody and glinting with the silver of scissor blades. A story for older children, ones who did not fear their own nightmares. And this version of the story would scramble the order of events. No one but Sam had heard what Miel was screaming into her hands. I lost the moon, she had said, sobbing against her fingers. I lost the moon. He never asked her what she meant. Even then, he knew better. Her feeling that the moon had slipped from her grasp seemed locked in a place so far inside her that to reach it would be to break her open. But this was why Sam painted shadows and lunar seas on paper and metal and glass, copying the shadows of Mare Imbrium and Oceanus Procellarum to give her back the moon. He had painted dark skies and bright moons on flat paper since he was old enough to hold a brush old enough to look through the library's astronomy atlases. But it wasn't until this girl spilled out of the water tower, sobbing over her lost moon, that Sam began painting so many copies of the brightest light in the night sky. He would never let it seem lost to her again. Moon had become his name to this town because of her. Because of her, this town had christened him. Without her, he had been nameless. He had not been Samir or Sam. He had been no one. 
They knew his name, no more than they knew who this girl had been before she was water. Lake of Autumn They'd touched each other every day since they were small. She'd put her palm to his forehead when she thought he had a fever. He'd set tiny gold star stickers on her skin on summer days, and at night had peeled them off, leaving pale constellations on her sun-darkened body. She'd seen the brown of her hand against the brown of his when they were children, and holding hands meant nothing more than that she liked how warm his palm was in the night air, or that he wanted to pull her to see something she had missed, a meteor shower, or a vine of double-flower morning glories, so blue they looked dyed. All these things reminded her of his moons, and his moons reminded her of all these things. He'd hung a string of them between her house and his, some as small as her cupped palms, others big enough to fill her arms. They brightened the earth and wild grass. They were tucked into trees, each giving off a ring of light just wide enough to meet the next, so she never walked in the dark. One held a trace of the same gold as those foil star stickers. Another echoed the blue of those morning glories Sam could find, even in the dark. Another was the pure, soft white of the frost flowers he showed her on winter mornings, curls of ice that looked like tulips and peonies. The one she passed under now was the color of a rose that had grown from her wrist when she and Sam were in ninth grade. She remembered it because in the hall at school, her sleeve had slipped back, and the rose accidentally brushed the elbow of a girl who recoiled, yelling, Watch where you're going. That same afternoon, when the girl's boyfriend broke up with her, she blamed Miel and that brush of petals. She cornered Miel in the girl's bathroom and looked like she was about to backhand her when Sam came up behind her and said, Oh, I wouldn't do that if I were you. His voice had been so level, more full of advice than a threat, that the girl had actually turned around. You know, the last girl who did that turned into a potted plant, right? He said, and he sold it with such caution and certainty that the girl believed it. She sank into all the rumors about Miel and Araceli, and she backed away. If Miel hadn't known Sam was her friend before, she knew after that. That was the first and last time he ever went into the girl's room by choice. Miel could chart their history by these moons lighting the path between the violet house where she lived with Araceli and the bright tiled roof of Sam's house. The closer she got to him, the more she felt it in her roses, like a moon pulling on a sea. Since she was small, the roses had grown from her skin, each bursting through the opening on her wrist that never healed. One grew, and she destroyed it, and another grew, and she destroyed it. But now she hesitated before cutting them or pushing them underwater so the river's current carried them away. Because for the past few months, they'd responded to Sam. The more time she spent around him, the more her wrist felt heavy and sore. He caught her holding her forearm during school and stole bags of crunchy, fluffy ice from the chemistry lab for her to put against her sleeve. If she thought of him too much, her roses grew deeper and brighter. The one on her wrist was now as dark pink as her favorite lipstick. Tonight, he was waiting behind his house, hands in his pockets. His stance showed neither impatience nor boredom. She always wondered if he saw her from his window, or if he just came outside early and didn't mind waiting. I stole something from work today, he said. The moons gave enough light to let her see he was holding his tongue against his back teeth, proud of his own guilt. You what? she asked. Don't worry, he said. I'll bring it back. I just wanted you to see it. Come on. Inside, he showed her the brush he used to pollinate each pumpkin blossom by hand. They only opened for one day, Sam had told her when he started at the Bonner's farm. An explanation for the slow, careful work of taking pollen from each anther and brushing it onto each flower's stigma. That small act made a blossom become a pumpkin. The Bonners gave Sam this task because they thought his skill with brushes covered in paint would translate to brushes coated in pollen. But Miel had never seen one of the brushes before. Now, Sam flicked the oat-colored bristles first against her forearm, and then against her rose. For those few seconds, the tiny birthmarks on her arm were grains of pollen, and her rose was the corolla of a pumpkin blossom. 
The bristles made her flinch, like the petals growing from her wrist had as much sensation as her fingers. They didn't. Yes, pulling on the stem would hurt her. Knocking the flower head against a kitchen table stung the opening her roses grew from. But the petals themselves were like her hair, rooted in her, but not the same kind of alive as her skin. For that moment, though, of those bristles skimming over that lipstick-colored rose, the sense that those petals could feel as much as her lips or her fingers shimmered through her. Her eyes flashed up to his. His eyes were a little more open than they always were, the brown clearer. The brush and his fingers stilled on her skin. He hadn't meant it like that. She knew that. She could tell by that startled look. This wasn't his fingers tracing her back and shoulders, finding stars. This wasn't her checking the flush of his forehead and then leading him home in the middle of a school day. This was a thing that turned into his mouth on hers. This was the pollination brush he'd forgotten to set down, still in his hands as he held her, bristles feathering against her neck. This was the breaking of the strange nervousness that had grown between them over the past few months. A hesitancy to touch that would vanish one day and reappear the next. She felt the shape of pumpkin blossoms glowing on her skin, waiting for Sam's fingers. The understanding settled on her that it was Sam, not the wooden-hilted brush, that held the magic of turning a vine-laced field into a thousand pumpkins. Now, Miel's body felt like soft, papery petals. She kissed him back, pushing him toward the stairs, him stumbling up them without turning around. Even with his eyes shut, taking the stairs by muscle memory, he was careful not to crush her rose. She reached for his belt and the top button of his jeans, and he let her. He slid his hand under her shirt, and she let him. He let her, she let him, and then they were in his bed. The smell of paint made the air in his room bitter, sharp. A tarp covered the floor, his brushes and paints and the makings of half-finished lights scattered in a way that looked disordered to her, but made sense to him. Light from the moon spilled a layer of milky lilac over the floor. They were covered in the blue-green of his bedroom walls and the smell of spices from his mother's kitchen that soaked into his hair and came off onto his sheets. Orange flower. Green cardamom. Pomegranate molasses. It was so sharp and vivid on him that it made her bite the back of his neck. He startled, then settled into the soft pressure of her teeth and set his fingers against her harder. He didn't take off his shirt. She didn't try to take it off him. He never took off his shirt, for the same reason he worked on the Bonner's farm. Their school let his work weeding the fields and cutting vines stand in for the P.E. requirement he'd put off since ninth grade. He couldn't meet it any other way, not if it meant changing for class or team practice in a locker room. His skin smelled like warm water, not taking on the scent of his soap. She ran her fingers over the faint scarring that shadowed his jawline, from acne he had both grown into and out of early. The petals of her rose skimmed his neck. She did that on purpose. And then along the inside of his thigh. She did that without meaning to. He shivered, but didn't draw back. Even when her touching him made her rose petals flick against his body, she kept a little distance between him and her wrist so the thorns wouldn't scratch him. When he traced her skin, the thought of everything he told her about the moon skimmed across her, about the lunar seas and bays. Mare Nubium and Mare Undarum, the sea of clouds and the sea of waves. Lacus Autumni and Sinus Iridum, the lake of autumn and the bay of rainbows. The features he painted with brushes and with his bare fingers. His hands were so sure, the pressure of his fingers so gradual and steady that she couldn't help thinking of his family years ago, their fields of crocuses, their quick, delicate work of picking the saffron threads from the center of those purple flowers. She wondered if this was a thing that lived in his blood and in his fingers, a craft that started as finding wisps of red among violet petals, and that, through years and generations, became the skill of finding, easily and without hesitation, what he was looking for. The one thing that marred it all, that made it anything shy of perfect, was the Bonner sisters. Las Gringas Bonitas. 
those pale girls, pretty and perfect. One stray thought and those threads of saffron turned to the red of their braids and curls. Just that single unwanted thought and the gradient of their hair swirled through Miel like fall leaves. The Bonner girls hadn't felt far from Miel since the first time she saw them at the water tower. She let Sam think it was just that Peyton had been holding that pumpkin she treated like a pet. But it was more than the pumpkin. The water had barely cleared from Miel's eyes when she saw the moon, caught between last quarter and full, disappear behind their heads. Even against the not yet dark sky, it lit up the red and gold and orange of their hair. From where Miel stood, her eyes feeling new, blurring everything, it looked like the moon had vanished into them, like they'd absorbed it. They had taken all its light. And Miel kept screaming, wanting to warn the boy standing in front of her that the moon was a thing that could be lost. Now, the Bonner sisters were older and beautiful, their eyes a fierce and fearless kind of open. Together, they were as imposing as an unmapped forest. Some called them witches, or how many hearts they'd broken. Some said they had hidden, in the woods, a stained glass coffin that acted like a chrysalis, turning each girl who slept in it as beautiful as every Bonner girl before her. But ever since Chloe had left town, they were no longer the Bonner sisters. It was just Leanne and Ivy and Peyton drifting through their father's fields. Sometimes Miel saw Leanne in the grocery store, picking out yellow apples, or Peyton riding her bike at the edge of town. Miel had never understood why, with the four of them around, Sam would ever choose her. Miel was a handful of foil stars, but they were the fire that made constellations. Her hair was the dark, damp earth under their family's farm, and they were curling vines and scrolled pumpkins. But the Bonner sisters weren't the ones who'd met Sam a thousand times in the open land between their houses. They hadn't shown him the slight differences in blues and browns of Arukana and Wyandotte chicken's eggs. And maybe these things had made Miel look different to Sam. Maybe the time he'd helped her shear a pair of jeans, the knees worn through, into cutoffs, made him overlook the fact that jeans fit her a little different in a thigh than they did the Bonner sisters. Or maybe the deep, bright colors of her roses distracted him from how her nails were almost never polished. Maybe the day she'd helped him paint his room the color of the ocean his father was born near, that afternoon when she'd gotten that deep blue-green all over the front of her, made Sam forget that she did not stretch out a shirt like the Bonner sisters. Except for Peyton, the youngest, the Bonner sisters filled their bras like batter poured into a cake pan. If those things made Miel look different to Sam, if that was why he was under her now, she didn't mind. Because she saw him as something different than anyone else did, too. She had seen him naked, almost naked. And she understood that with his clothes off, he was the same as he was with them on. New Sea One day... They would be no more than that fairy tale. They would be two children named Honey and Moon, folded into the stories whispered through this town. But tonight, they were not those children. Tonight, they were Sam and Miel, and he was pulling her on top of him, and then under him. The way she moved against him made him feel the sharp presence of everything he had between his legs, and, for just that minute, a forgetting of everything he didn't. He thought he knew her body. He was so sure that he could have drawn it, mapped it as easily as the lunar seas he could paint without looking at a map of the moon. But under his hands, against his own body, she was both safe and unfamiliar. She was a world unknown. She was a place whose darkness held not fear, but the promise of stars. Even against him, she was a locked world, sealed off, even with how she let him put his hands anywhere he tried to, even with how she took his hands and put it where he was too shy to go. She had so many secrets. He'd given her every one he had, from why he never took off his shirt, to the truth of how badly his mother had wanted a child, and the cold bargain she'd made to get one. Miel still had thousands of secrets, small and shimmering, 
She held them tight in her hands, and he had nothing left that he had not given up. Bay of Harmony The day after Miel slept with Sam was the day Chloe Bonner came back. That morning, Miel came downstairs and found Araceli in the kitchen, putting on coffee and yawning at a morning so new it was still silver. Miel set three cups she'd collected from her room in the kitchen sink. Lately, Araceli had had it with Miel leaving forgotten cups of tea on counters and tables. She'd find one and say, Will you put this in the sink already? I feel like I'm living in a coffee house. Even in her nightgown, without her makeup on, Araceli was a slice of color against the window. Her hair was as bright as the fruit of a nectarine. The brown of her skin looked like raw gold stripped from quartz. And she stood tall enough that she looked like she could meet the gaze of the sky out on the horizon. The stories said that Araceli had appeared one summer, along with a hundred thousand butterflies. The butterflies covered the town like bright gold scales, powdered wings shivering in the breezes. And when, early that autumn, they all flitted away, there was Araceli, this strange, tall young woman with skin like those iridescent wings. Of course, that was years before Miel fell out of the water tower before the water had given her back, so she never saw that cloud of wings. Araceli handed Miel a spoon of honey, thick and deep as amber. Fireweed, Araceli said, pulling her hair back into a loose bun. Her fingernails, painted the color of achiote seeds, stood brick red against the pale gold. Just got it from that place on the edge of town. Araceli knew how much Miel liked honey, how she ate it straight every kind Araceli brought home. This woman, who acted as something between a sister and mother to Miel, knew every food and spice she liked and disliked. She knew that windstorms gave her nightmares, and that the light of Sam's moons let her sleep. But Miel didn't know how to tell Araceli about what had happened with Sam, about sneaking out of his house before his mother came home about the soreness in Miel's body that felt like a thing to hold on to instead of wait out. Of course, there were some things Araceli did not know. Sometimes she seemed about to ask Miel something, maybe about who Miel had been before she spilled out of the water tower, or if she had ever belonged to anyone else before she belonged to Araceli. But Araceli would always open her mouth, pause, and then close it again and turn back to the sink or the stove. Araceli knew, without being told, the things Miel did not want to talk about. Now, Miel couldn't even meet Araceli's eyes. Araceli's work was curing lovesickness. It was her gift to know when a heart was overrun with wanting someone. When it came to Araceli, this town alternated between gratitude and blame. At night, they came to her, asking her help for their worn-out hearts. During the day, they whispered that she was a witch, or blamed her for the powdery blight bleaching out an orchard's harvest, or held her responsible for the storm that might rain out that year's lighting of the pumpkin lanterns. They gave her the same inconsistency they might give a lover. Adoration at night, disavowal in the morning. How indebted they were to her meant they offered her either scorn or respect, depending on the time of day and how many people were watching. Miel had learned to live with the self-conscious feeling that Araceli could sense the weight of her heart. This morning, she was sure if she let Araceli look at her for too long, she'd know. The fact that Araceli liked Sam made it worse. Miel imagined Araceli thinking of them more like brother and sister, recoiling at the idea of Miel digging her fingers into Sam's back. Araceli poured coffee into heavy mugs, and Miel flushed and looked down. She'd never noticed that the color of these cups, blue-green as eucalyptus, was only a little off from Sam's bedroom walls. She's back, Araceli said. She half sang the words, drawing out each syllable until it was almost a trill. Miel licked the honey off the spoon. It tasted a little like tea, the flavor from the stalks of pink flowers that dotted scarred land after a fire. Who? she asked. La Ultima Bruja. 
Miel gave Araceli a laugh. This was one of a thousand reasons Miel loved Araceli. So often, Araceli was called a bruja herself, a witch. And still, she didn't flinch at calling someone else the word. Miel's smile vanished the second she realized who Araceli meant. Araceli was trying to make a joke of it, sipping her coffee like this was any other morning gossip. She was all charm and assurance. It was what made her so good at curing lovesickness. Less skilled curanderas left their patients stricken with susto, a fright so deep they wandered the woods startled and blind. But Araceli never left a lovesick man or woman sobbing on the wooden table. She placed her palms on their shoulders, whispering to them so they barely noticed the lovesickness leaving their bodies. Miel knew Araceli's voice better than those men and women. She heard each catch and hitch. It wasn't that Araceli was afraid of the Bonner girls. Araceli wasn't afraid of anything. She had pity for Miel's fear of water, but little patience for her fear of pumpkins. Each fall, on the night that half the town came out to set carved, glowing pumpkins floating on the river, Miel hid in her room, and Araceli stood outside the door, saying, Oh, for God's sake, they're fruits, not hornets. Get out here. But even Araceli was wary of the fire-haired girls. She'd always thought their nervous mother and father pulled them from school less because of what happened with Chloe and more because if they taught them at home, it was less obvious that the girls had no friends but one another, that they never invited anyone over, that they flirted with boys on crowded streets, but that even those boys were not their friends, would not last the next frost or blossom that marked a new season. Miel left the spoon on the counter and went back upstairs. Don't do it, Araceli called up. Miel heard the smile in her voice, but that smile didn't veil the warning. I mean it, Araceli said. Don't do it. You'll just torture yourself. Miel listened. She listened until about four that afternoon, when she stood at the edge of the Bonner's farm trying to keep away the echo of Araceli's words. If Mr. or Mrs. Bonner saw her, she could always say that she was there to see Sam. She could say he was going to show her how he used the pollination brushes. No, something else. Not the pollination brushes. Miel kept her distance from the vines. No matter Araceli's reassurances that they were just fruit, Miel still feared pumpkins the way other girls feared spiders or grass snakes. Then she saw the curtain of Chloe's hair the softening light turning it peach. The opening of Miel's rose grew from prickled and turned hot. Chloe had graduated last year at 19 and had turned 20 while she was away. 20, that number that Miel always thought of as making someone, in some final way, an adult. Now, Chloe swept across her family's side yard wearing cigarette jeans that would have looked out of style on anyone else and a sweater thin enough to show the pink tone of her skin underneath. She'd grown out her hair. When she left last winter, it had fallen to her shoulders in uneven curls. Now it tumbled to her hip, the weight stretching it straight, so light it was almost blonde. She must have been wearing jeans that tight to show her flat stomach, to show that the thing everyone knew about had not happened. When Chloe left, the Bonner sisters had lost just enough of their hold to let every other girl in town breathe. Their parents, as frightened of their own daughters as they were concerned for them, had pulled Leanne, Ivy, and Peyton out of school, convinced they'd end up like Chloe. So, the girls stayed in that house. They sat at the kitchen table with their mother's lesson plans. They peeked out of windows with white edging that stood crisp against the house's navy paint. Or they wandered through their father's fields, barefoot or in soft, worn slippers they borrowed from their mother but were too vain to own themselves. Chloe wore no shoes. Her feet and her ankles, bare from her cropped jeans, were pale as lumina pumpkins. Miel dragged her gaze away from the corner of the farm where Chloe stood, sure if she stared too long, Chloe would know and catch her looking. Her eyes swept over the fields and found Sam. First, his hair, like black ribbon curled with scissors. The harvest season had left him even darker, his forearms the brown of a well-summer chicken's egg. 
He wore that color with the pride of knowing he'd inherited it from his grandmother, a woman Miel knew only from the few bright details he remembered enough to tell her. The metal of his shears glinted in his hands. He was checking for vines that had started to die off, going away, he said they called it, and shells just beginning to harden. For that moment, he could have been any boy. He could have been Roman Brantley, who once had a gaze so reckless teachers couldn't meet it. But he'd lost that look to Leanne Bonner, to her hair that was so dark red it was almost auburn, to the bursts of freckles fanning her temples like wings. She still had his grandfather's hunting jacket, which Leanne swore she'd give back if he ever asked. Of course, he couldn't look her in the eye long enough to do it. Or Win Yarrow, who broke up with his girlfriend of two years for Peyton. Peyton, the shortest and youngest of the Bonner sisters, with pumpkin-colored hair her mother barrel-curled every morning, and who everyone but him knew would never be interested. Wynne lost not only his girlfriend, but every friend who took her side. Miel backed away from the edge of the pumpkin field, trying to vanish into the shadows before Sam saw her. The Bonner sisters, like everyone else in town, had seen her with Sam so many times that they noted it no more than seeing her alone. But if Miel came up to him now, he might slouch and blush in a way that traced a ribbon of cool air in the dusty heat. And when he did, Miel's smile might glint like a coin. The Bonner girls would see it. It would draw them. They would watch how Sam sometimes climbed trees to set his moons where the branches met and joined, but just as often threw a thin rope over a bough and pulled the moon up. They would notice how, when he had to climb trees to put in new candles or relight ones that had gone out, he did it without hurry. How if a moon was fragile, he carried a wooden ladder from his mother's shed and leaned it against the trunk so he wouldn't jostle the moon as he climbed. They would realize how beautiful this odd boy was, how the moons he hung in the trees at night glowed like a bowl of stars. They would see how his painted lunar seas gave off different shades of light. No boy was ever so interesting to them as when he was interesting to someone else. Chloe turned, her braid running the length of her spine, rubber band hitting the small of her back as she followed the brick walkway. She took the stairs to the front porch, and the soles of her feet, dust-covered, flashed a little darker than her ankles. But even the defiance in how she whipped her braid through the air couldn't hide the way she held herself a little differently. Her stomach was flat, but her hips had spread. She folded her arms, even thinner than when she'd left, like she was cold. She looked both fearless and young as any Bonner sister, but now the set to her shoulders gave her the proud but cautious look of being someone's mother. But maybe that was just because Miel knew. Everyone knew. The thing Chloe had tried to keep secret had become its own little life. It had grown so big it refused to go unremarked on. No matter how tight Chloe's jeans, people would look at her stomach and wonder if she was showing again. She may have been a porcelain figurine, repaired by the finest hands, but she had still cracked and broken. When anyone held her up to the light, the milky threads of where she'd been glued back together showed. She'd never rule the Bonner girls again. Her reign would pass down to Ivy. Not Leanne, even though Leanne was the second oldest. If anyone called Leanne dim, the Bonner girls would have scratched them to bleeding with their unfiled, bright-polished nails. But that wouldn't mean they didn't agree. Now that the Bonner girls were together again, they were a force as strong as the wind that ripped the leaves off maples and sycamores. They were every shade of orange and gold in an October forest. The life would come back into them, and every girl in town who loved any boy in town would take a little longer to fall asleep tonight. If the Bonner girls knew Miel wanted to keep Sam, that she was not just a strange girl who was friends with a strange boy, they would realize how much fun it would be to take him. It was why they had never had any friends at school except one another. Whenever a girl wanted a boy, so did they. The second they sensed that Miel cared would be the second they decided he would be the next boy whose heart they broke. Not that they ever tried to break anything. They never meant to hurt anyone. They were children petting a cat too hard for no reason except that they liked the feel of its fur. 
Together, they were similar enough to dazzle half the boys in this town, different enough that they'd intrigue Sam. And if he ever trusted them as much as he trusted Miel, they would ruin him. They would take everything from him without trying. Miel's wrist prickled. She looked down at her rose. The pink of her favorite lipstick was draining out of the petals, giving way to red and then orange, until every petal had turned to copper or amber or rust. Las gringas bonitas, these four girls who'd made the moon disappear, were back. Lake of Hatred She had to kill it. She'd already waited too long, not wanting to slice away the rose she'd worn on her body the night she slept with Sam. And if she kept it on her body, the Bonner girls would know. They'd see the colors of each of their hair, the copper of Ivy's hair at the center, the soft orange and strawberry blonde of Peyton's and Chloe's, the almost brown of Leanne's at the edges. If they were witches, like the rumors said, they'd know. Even if they weren't, they would wonder why Miel's rose held their colors in its petals, and they would look at her, and then at Sam. Miel paused, finding a break in the familiar silhouettes along the river. Two shapes stood against the dark, close enough to Miel that she hid in a tree's shadow so they wouldn't see her. Her eyes adjusted to the dark, letting her see one feature at a time. A girl. A boy. Neither standing in enough light for her to recognize them. But she could make out their posture, the girls inclining forward, eager and flirtatious, her hands flitting in the space between them like birds. From where Miel stood, a tree branch obscured the girl's face, but the moon lit her hair enough to show the color. A veil of rich red that could only belong to a Bonner girl. The boy's stance did not match the girl's. He did not lean forward. He did not try to touch her. There was no sense that he was making an attempt at persuading her, to let him kiss her, or to get her sisters to sneak out and see him and his friends, or anything at all. He seemed bored, humoring her rather than being entranced by her. The way he held his shoulders, facing a little out, made him look like he would leave as soon as he could figure out a way that wasn't rude. Miel knew this same scene. She'd seen it when girls had tried flirting with Sam, who seemed as oblivious as he was indifferent. She'd been half of it, with other boys, to get back at Sam for, she flushed, realizing this later, nothing more than being interesting to another girl. But she'd never seen it with one of the Bonner girls. The Bonner girls had stolen boyfriends, enchanted reverend sons, lured away boys, who before never did anything without their mothers telling them to. If a Bonner girl couldn't interest a boy she wanted, if she couldn't have anything she wanted, how could she keep her own last name? Miel moved a little farther down the river, putting tree cover between her and those two shapes. She knelt alongside the river and stared down into the dark water, trying to make out a shape, any sign that something was down there. Fish, the glimmer of pondweed leaves, or the river mermaids Sam told her stories about so Miel would one day be unafraid to go in the river. She wasn't ready. She was never ready. Even when she was anxious to have the weight of the rose gone, she cringed before slicing the blades across the stem. Rumors about her roses laced this town's gossip. Some said her roses could turn the hearts of those who had no desire. Others insisted their perfume, the soft brush of their petals, was enough to enchant the reticent, the frightened the guarded. One said Miel had given a pale pink rose, barely blushing, to one of Araceli's friends. A boy had done something so bad to her that she could not think of parting her lips to be kissed, even years later, when another boy, with hands as gentle as tulip tree leaves, wanted to love her. Another said that last year she'd given a rose to a farmhand who had fallen in love with an apple grower's daughter, but who could not see past how her eyes were the same green as his family's a family that never let him forget his were brown. But Araceli had cured them both, not Miel and her roses. Araceli had convinced that girl to love the boy with hands like tulip tree leaves. And the farmhand, he had come to Araceli, and so had the apple grower's daughter, 
wanting her heart rid of her love for a boy too shy to love her back. They had both wanted lovesickness cures, and Araceli had told them both to come at the same time. When they saw each other in Araceli's indigo room, when they both realized they were heartbroken enough to want the love torn from their rib cages, they touched each other with their hands and their mouths, and they forgot they wanted to be cured. Araceli was all the magic and skill. Miel was just a body so restless petals burst from her skin. Araceli was all the beauty and goodness in their violet house. Miel was a girl stained with rusted water and the blood on her hands of two people whose names she could not speak. The silver-plated scissors, both the strangest and the most useful gift Araceli had ever given her, whined when she opened them. She poised the scissors low, close to her skin, and snapped the blade shut. Pain shivered along her veins. It found her heart and her stomach and everything in her that was alive. Blood seeped from the opening. Pain made Miel's fingers heavy. It weighted her to the ground. It hurt like a knife blade, pressing into her wrist so hard she felt it flash to her ribs. She let the rose slip into the water, an offering to the mother who now lived on the wind but had died in this water. When the storms came, Miel could hear the murmur of her mother's voice beneath the shriek of the winds, like she was trying to whisper Miel back to sleep. This was the only gift Miel could give her, the obedience of destroying the roses her mother had feared. She wanted to give her more, a fearlessness of water. But inside Miel was the small, echoing voice of the girl Sam had found, a girl whispering that she should not trust water she could not see to the bottom of. She didn't remember her father as well as her mother. She knew he was a curandero, the kind skilled at treating wounds with a talent for setting bones that gave him work as a jucero. And she remembered his hands, how gently he cut her roses away and then covered the wound with a bandage. Sometimes she tried settling into the memory, but she knew him so little he was not really hers. The petals vanished under the surface and the water rippled like the hem of a dress. The moon refracted into a dozen sickles. Even with as little as Miel remembered, she remembered the whispers about how children with roses growing from their skin would poison their own brothers or steal the rings and rosaries from their family's graves. It didn't matter if the roses grew from their wrists, like Miel's, or from their ankles or backs. Every son or daughter in their family whose body made roses, they said, turned bitter and ungrateful. Once, their family made cakes with rose water and cardamom. But that was before roses were things edged with the fear of new mothers. Young women were worrying over their sons and daughters, looking for the first signs of green coming through their skin. The river settled back into its slow current, and the soft rushing of the water carried the sound of muffled sobbing. It broke into small, stifled cries. Miel startled, searching the sky and listening for the wind. When the wind came, she listened for her mother's voice hoped she wouldn't hear her crying. The only thing she wanted more than she wanted Sam was for her mother to know that Miel forgave her, that she understood why she did what she did, that she knew her mother loved her. But the sound wasn't coming from the sky or even from under the water. It pulled Miel's eyes down the length of the bank. The dark outlined the figure of a girl, arms crossed, wind fluffing her hair. The Bonner girl, though Miel still couldn't tell which one. Miel got to her feet, pain spinning in her forearm. Are you okay? She called, trying to keep her voice calm like Araceli's, soft and clear as the trickle of water over stones. But the girl still jumped. Her gaze snapped toward Miel, and the moon turned her face as pale as its own surface. Ivy Bonner. The ribbons of light off the river showed her features. Her cheeks shone wet. Hints of copper warmed the edges of her hair, even in the dark. Her nose sat between Chloe's, long and straight and proud like their father's, and Peyton's, short and upturned like their mother's. Ivy nodded, dabbing her fingers over her cheeks. Miel was not important enough for Ivy to pretend she hadn't been crying. 
That nod made Miel feel like she was intruding, like she'd been summoned and now was dismissed. She clutched the silver-plated scissors and turned her back to the river. But Ivy took a few steps toward her, not in a hurried way, but quickly enough that Miel stopped in her path. What are you doing out here? Ivy asked, and in the same moment glanced down at Miel's bare wrist and the scissors. Oh, she said. Ivy lifted her eyes to Miel's again. This close, the salt and water drying on her cheeks looked like the thinnest frost. Does it hurt? Ivy asked. What? Miel asked, cringing at the uncertainty in her own voice. Cutting them, Ivy said. To say no would seem like a kind of defiance Miel could never wear as well as Ivy or her sisters. To say yes was too much of an admission. Miel nodded. She hadn't been this close to Ivy since the Bonner sisters left school. And now, so close to her that she could smell the watery camellia scent of her soap, all Miel could think of was Clark Anderson, another of the boys lost to the Bonner sisters. Clark had thought a girl like Ivy, with her hair the color and shine of new pennies, could cure him of wanting to kiss John Sweden under the new water tower. He slept with Ivy in her bedroom in broad daylight, with Sam and the other workers on the farm below her window. And less than twelve hours later, he was kissing John again, this time on the water tower ladder at midnight, where people could just recognize their shapes against the stars. He disappeared from the town the next week, but unlike Chloe, or the boy whose baby she had, no one knew where he'd gone. The way Ivy kept blinking, stung by the salt of her own tears, made pity spread through Miel, until she had to give it words. He doesn't matter, you know, Miel said. Ivy drew back. What? Miel knew to be quiet, but she wanted to even out what she'd said, like smoothing the layer of cream on a tray leches cake. He's just a guy, Miel said. Who cares? Ivy's eyes tensed and narrowed. With that pinching of her eyelashes, Miel knew she'd made a mistake. Now Ivy knew Miel had seen. She would hold against Miel her witnessing this sign of the Bonner girls losing their power over this town's boys. Ivy tilted her head, watching Miel's wrist. Why do you kill them? she asked, neither horrified nor concerned, more curious, more like she thought drowning those petals was a waste. Miel sank into the relief of Ivy changing the subject, then realized this was something she wanted to talk about even less. She knew how everyone looked at her, at her roses. The rumor that if a girl slipped one under a boy's pillow, if he breathed in the scent while he slept, she could make him fall in love with her. Or that, for even better effect, the petals could be sugared and baked into a vanilla cake or lavender alfajores, but only with the secret recipes used by the girls in the Violet House. For that second, her nervousness around Ivy, her feeling that she was her handmaid waiting for dismissal, softened. Miel might have been as strange to Ivy as the Bonner sisters were to her. She lived in a house as violet as blueberry cream. Roses grew from her wrist, and Araceli, this woman she lived with, invited lovesick men and women to lie down on her wooden table so she could cure their broken hearts. If Araceli had been there, she would have told Miel to stop standing there, stop waiting for La Bruja to give her instructions. Miel tipped her head, a greeting and a goodbye. But then her heart pinched. The Bonner sisters had rarely talked to anyone but one another and the boys they loved and wrecked. Leanne had been quiet, but friendly enough when she and Sam had to do a group presentation on the orographic effect. Sam wrote the report while Leanne drew and colored in all the pictures. When Miel got her period a week early, Chloe had, without comment, slid her a tampon under the bathroom stall. They were neither rude nor warm. They just preferred one another's company to anyone else's. Now, maybe Ivy was lonely enough that she'd talk to anyone. Chloe had been gone for months. She'd missed Leanne turning 18 and Peyton turning 15. Ivy, 16, wouldn't have her birthday until December. Now that Chloe was back, Miel imagined everyone as formal and careful, 
so attentive to Chloe that she felt smothered, and the rest of the sisters felt both jealous and grateful not to be her. Leanne and Ivy and Peyton would have crowded together not to miss her, to make it less obvious that she was gone. Now they would all try to shuffle apart to make room for her. Chloe had been sent away the same week she had started to show. Her baby now lived with the aunt she had stayed with these past six months. And, likewise, the boy she'd been seeing was sent to live with relatives in a town so far away Niel had never heard of it. Her sisters must have both missed her and considered her a stranger. This tall young woman who was now a mother, who was angled in her arms and nose, but soft in her hips and breasts. Ivy, Miel called out. Ivy turned. Miel was one of a hundred girls who would sleep better if the Bonner girls lost their peculiar power. But she couldn't help feeling a little sorry for Ivy. If you ever need anyone to talk to, Miel said. Ivy paused and then nodded, saving Miel from having to say the rest and herself from having to hear it. Sea of Islands His mother knew. She'd stayed the night before at the Hodges. Mr. and Mrs. Hodge were in the city until morning, so they'd asked her to watch their children. She'd probably told them bedtime stories about a brother and sister crossing a forest guided only by stars, or a girl learning the language of Kashmir stags and musk deer, or one Sam had heard from his grandmother, the story of a girl named Layla and a boy called Majnoon. Now his mother stood in the doorway. As soon as she looked at him, he caught the slight lift of her chin, half a nod, that told him she understood. She looked tired, but not wearied, this morning's coal drawn over the smudged echo of yesterday's eyeliner. So soft, gray ringed her eyelashes. The coal, and the way she painted it on, was one of the few traditions from their family she'd held to, that one from her mother's side. Her father, Sam's grandfather, had given her washed-out blue eyes that looked even paler the way she lined them. Neither surprise nor disappointment crossed her face. Only a breath in, a steadying. As much as Sam wanted this to pass by without comment, he knew better. Finally, she said, Well, I hope you are both safe. She set down the red and blue tapestry bag she'd taken over to the Hodges. I'd hate for you to get that girl pregnant. Araceli would murder me. He was supposed to laugh. He knew he was supposed to laugh. But he couldn't force out the sound. He wished he were different. He wanted to laugh off her words, to say back, Oh, very funny. Short of the kind of miracles Araceli taught Miel out of her Bible. Sam wasn't getting anyone pregnant. And you trust her, his mother said, more checking than questioning. Of course he trusted Miel. She knew everything that could wreck him, but acted like she didn't. When he was eight, and she walked in on him changing, she didn't scream or run down the hall. She just shut the door and left, and when he pulled on his jeans and his shirt and went after her, he found her sitting on the back steps. Her expression was so full of both wondering and recognition, as though she almost understood, but not quite that he sat down next to her and told her more than he'd ever planned to. Now she slipped him tampons at school because he couldn't risk carrying them in his bag. They had it timed, so they passed each other while she was leaving the girl's bathroom and he was going into the boys, the two of them clasping hands just long enough for the handoff. Once they'd worked out the system, they never spoke of it again, and she never brought it up. He never asked how she always knew when... He didn't have to. They'd spent enough time together that their bodies had pulled on each other. And now they bled at the same time, when the moon was a thin curve of light. If Miel had been anyone else, her knowing this, the steady rhythm of her knowing every month would have been humiliating. Sam braced himself, though for what, he wasn't sure. Not a morality lecture. His mother had never cautioned him to wait until he was married agnostic, indifferent to the faiths of both her father's family and her mother's. She had barely tolerated Sam going along with Miel and Araceli to church and Sunday school. 
She allowed it only because she thought things would be easier for him if this town thought he was a good Christian boy, a phrase she never said without disdain edging her words. She'd made it clear that any god she believed in could not be contained within walls, certainly not inside the whitewashed clapboard of the local church. But he was never supposed to sleep with a girl. This had been temporary, him living this way, with his breasts bound flat and his hair cut as short as his mother would let him. It was so he could take care of his mother, said there would be a man of the house even though his mother had no sons. Are you mad? he asked, trying not to cringe and look down. His mother hated when he did that, which made him tend toward it even more. If you didn't hurt yourself or anyone else, it's not my place to be, she said. Sometimes she said things like that, and he could almost see the pallor of frost on her words. It's not my place to be disappointed, she'd said when he was failing math three years ago. It's your future, not mine. And that made him feel even worse. But it wasn't like that now. There wasn't the same posture of holding herself tall and straight, her expression still. Now her face looked soft with worry. Worse, pity. Are you upset? he asked. She put her fingers to her temple, shut her eyes, let out a long breath that turned into a sigh. Sam, she said, the words sounding like wind, like a soft, sad song. Whenever she said his name like that, it meant the same thing. That whether she or anyone else was upset wasn't the point. That failing math grade or lost virginity, this was his life. And to her mind, he wasn't acting like it. Not as long as his first question was, are you mad? Are you okay? His mother asked. I think so, he said. Is she? I think so. He would grow out of this, he wanted to tell her. The same way he'd grown out of saying his favorite color was clear. Why? Miel had asked him. Because everything clear is magic because it's invisible, he told her. And Miel had grown out of saying her favorite color was rainbow. Why, he'd asked her. Because they all look prettier together, she'd said. And because I don't want to pick. He would wait it out. His grandmother had told him the name for these girls. She had brought it with her from Pakistan, and from stories she'd heard from across the border in Afghanistan. Bacha Posh dressed as a boy. Girls whose parents decided that, until they were grown, they would be sons. Sam and his mother had lost his grandmother when he was so small he could barely remember the wrinkles of her face and whether the brown of her eyes was more gray or gold. But he remembered her voice, her telling him that their family's saffron farm in Kashmir had been small, but for its size, the most productive for a hundred miles how it took a hundred thousand of those purple crocuses to yield less than a kilogram of saffron. When his grandmother told him this, it was always with a current of sadness beneath her pride. Their family had had to leave Kashmir to stay with distant relatives in Peshawar, abandoning their bright fields. As things around them grew worse, that was how she always put it, things were getting worse. Trading the spice from their fields became impossible. And when she got to that part of the story, the part that left her heart bitter, she turned to stories that did not pinch and bite, like the stories of these girls. Daughters who lived as sons in families who had no sons. These girls spoke to boys and men in the street. They escorted their sisters out. When Sam heard these stories, he felt a clawing envy as strong as if he knew these girls by name. He had been four, his grandmother only a few months gone. When he decided he could, he would, be one of these girls. He would be a bacha posh. He would be the same kind of boy as those girls who lived as sons. But when those girls grew up, they became women. And maybe their lives as wives and mothers at first felt cramped, narrow after the wide, cleared road of being boys. But whatever freedom they missed was not because they wanted to be boys again. It was because they wanted to be both women and unhindered. That was his problem. Sam was sure of it. He couldn't be a girl. 
But maybe, if he waited out these years in boys' clothes and short hair, he would grow up enough to want to be a woman. He would wake up and this part of him would be gone, like rain and wind wearing down a hillside. You know, I never wanted a son or a daughter, she said. Mom, he said, trying to cut her off. I didn't think about it that way, she said, ignoring him. I just wanted a child. Sam nodded. He'd heard the story before. How his father had come from a family of fishermen in Campania, all of whom were famous for catching a kind of red-mantled squid that came close enough to the surface only during new moons. And now his father's lack of talent with that squid was the first of many things that made Sam come to be. But she didn't go on with the story. Do you want to talk? She asked. Sam picked up the tapestry bag to take it upstairs for her. No. Bay of the Center Miel picked up the phone thinking it was Sam. When he got back from his shift to the Bonner's farm, he'd call her, never starting with a greeting. He'd hear her answer and then start with something like, I just saw a woman jog past the hardware store with two parakeets, one on each shoulder. Or, the King of Hearts is the only one without a mustache. Ever notice that? She was one of the few people Sam would talk to on the phone, afraid of how the line skewed his voice a little higher when he was always working to keep it low. But it wasn't Sam. It was Ivy, asking Miel to come over. Not asking, just saying, come over. Miel wondered if Ivy was calling on the Ivory Princess phone that had once belonged to her grandmother. So old it had a rotary dial and a silver base. That phone, according to Sam, was something buyers always wanted to see when they came to negotiate pumpkin prices. Carly Zietlow, the girl Miel shared a desk with in math class, said the Bonner girls took pictures of one another with it each time they dressed up, once before dances and now before the pumpkin lighting each October. A week had gone by since Miel had seen Ivy at the river. She'd settled deep into the relief that Ivy had disregarded her offer and had forgotten about it. Now, Ivy hung up. So softly, the noise was a single, crisp click. Ivy's voice stayed inside Miel's ear like the sound of the ocean caught in a shell. The words had sounded open, guileless, one girl asking another outside to play. But there was also the edge of something a little alluring like the piloncillo sugar Araceli melted into hot chocolate. It made Miel cringe, thinking of every time Sam heard that voice as he bent down to the vines crossing the Bonner's fields. But in those two words, Miel thought she caught a little of that same sadness. Ivy's voice matched that same blank, damp-cheeked look she'd had by the river. So she did what Ivy said. If no one in this town had cared what happened to Miel, she would still be wild-eyed, hiding in the brush where the old water tower had fallen. Or in Sam's house, his mother wondering what to do with her. It was the least Miel could do to go over, even if the Bonner sisters, the whole Bonner house, scared her. The Bonner sisters talked to so few people outside that house that Ivy's request seemed like something of an honor, and something dangerous to turn down. Compared to the violet house Miel and Araceli lived in, with Araceli's blue-green cups and her kitchen table, yellow as a Meyer lemon, the Bonner's farmhouse looked so neat and tame. That navy paint made the white trim so bright. The shutters were hooked in place. The lace curtains in the windows looked age-softened, but Mrs. Bonner bleached them so often they never yellowed. The door was open, only the screen shut. That seemed like an invitation to come in without ringing the bell. The strangest thing about the house was their mother's mint green refrigerator, an antique that, according to Araceli, she spent more money to repair than it would have cost to replace it. The rest was so much more muted, so ordinary, compared to the girls and even the farm. The kitchen counters were plain white tile. Linen dish towels, creased and folded, were stacked next to the sink. There was no orange, like the girl's hair or the Cinderella pumpkins, flat and deep-ribbed. No deep green or gold or blue-gray like the few rare ones dotting the field. Miel's eyes moved over the first floor, 
until they landed on those four shades of red hair. Las Gringas Bonitas. All four of them. The Bonner girls clustered around a wooden dining table. Round, no bigger than needed to fit the six Bonners, or at most them and a couple of guests. As though Mr. and Mrs. Bonner assumed their daughters would never leave them, or that they would leave and never come back, never bring their husbands and children for Thanksgiving or Christmas. Chloe still wore those cigarette jeans, but now with a turtleneck that covered her freckled collarbone. Leanne had pulled her hair, so much darker than the rest of theirs, but still so red, into a bun that was already falling out. She rested her elbows on the table, one hand cupped loosely in the other. Peyton was tracing her finger along the circle of a water stain, her hair in a braid so much like Chloe's that Chloe must have done it. Ivy leaned against a sideboard, hip against a drawer. They all looked at Miel. They'd all been waiting. You're not going to kill your roses anymore, Ivy said. It wasn't until that moment that Miel noticed the vase at the table center. She wondered how she'd missed it, the glass as dark blue as the Bonner's house. The sleeve of Miel's sweater covered her newest rose, as pale yellow as a candle flame. But Leanne and Chloe were looking at her wrist as though they could see through the fabric. She pulled her eyes away from the vase to the Bonner sisters' faces. Miel looked at Ivy. They don't do what you think they do, she said. Her roses, left under a pillow, would not make boys fall in love with the Bonner sisters. They would not give them back what they had before Chloe's body held another little life. You're not going to kill your roses anymore, Ivy said again, opening a sideboard drawer. Each word was as calm and sure as the first time. When you grow one, you're going to bring it to us. In Ivy's face, Miel saw a calm that fell between them like a sheet. The Bonner girls were losing their strange power, but Ivy thought these roses could get it back. They could make any boys they wanted fall in love with them. This town would understand that the Bonner girls could take whatever they wanted, and that fact would ring louder than any whispers about Chloe. Miel looked around the downstairs, wondering where Mr. and Mrs. Bonner were. Either they weren't home, or they were upstairs, or the sisters didn't care. If they thought their daughters were, for once, having someone over, they might be keeping their distance, not wanting to disturb the strange, unknowable act of girls becoming friends. No, Miel said. They're mine. The words sounded petty, but they were true. Her roses belonged to her. Her cutting them away and then drowning them was her offering to the mother who had feared them. Chloe tilted her head. Her braid skimmed the side of her neck and traced the outer curve of her breast. Miel wondered if her breasts were heavy and full, and if so, how long it would take her body to realize there was no baby here, no one needing her milk. But Leanne spoke before Chloe did. It must make you sad, Leanne said, in a way that wasn't warm enough to sound kind or sharp enough to sound mean. What happened with your mother? Miel's neck turned as perspiration damp as the night she and Sam saw a lynx in the woods. Its pale fur had shone in the dark, its ruff banded in black. It had eyes the color of the dark yellow veins in Canyon Jasper. Two wisps of dark fur curved off the tips of its ears. Don't run, Sam had told her. You'll just be telling her you're less than she is. I am less than she is, Miel had said. The lynx's fur, gray tinged with red and gold, had looked like strands of light. You don't know anything about my mother, Miel said. I heard a story from a woman a few towns up the river, Chloe said. One of my aunt's friends, this old lady who talked about a woman who tried to kill her children and then killed herself. That's not what happened, Miel said. None of that was the way it happened. I doubt that's what people would think if they knew, Chloe said. Lower your head, Sam had told her the night they saw the lynx. And your eyes. Miel had, tipping her chin down, still watching the lynx's face. She still remembered the feeling of perspiration dampening the small of her back. Now back up, he'd said. Slowly. You don't want to look like you're retreating. I am retreating, she'd said. Miel met Chloe's gaze, 
shrugging and shaking her head to say, I don't know what you're talking about. The woman in the old lady's story could have been any woman, anyone else's mother. You look like her, Leanne said, without malice, not baiting her. But Miel almost asked where they had gotten a picture of her mother. Did they have it, or was it pasted into that old woman's photo album? She didn't ask, but stopping herself was enough of a flinch to tell them they were right. One flinch, and they had her. Miel not only had the petals they thought could root them back into being the Bonner sisters, she had committed the crime of witnessing one of them fail, seeing Ivy and that bored, polite boy. Peyton was still tracing that watermark. She couldn't meet Miel's eye. Of course she couldn't, not after everything Sam had done for her. Miel tried to make her feet move, but her shoes felt heavy as glass. The night they saw the lynx, Sam had put his hand on her shoulder blade and guided her out of the lynx's line of sight. The warmth of his palm had come through her shirt so quickly she thought the pattern of blush-colored flowers would turn dark as wet cranberries. But she was not as calm, as steady with logic, as Sam. Isn't it worth it to you? Chloe asked. So everyone doesn't find out all the terrible things she did? Of course it was worth it to Miel. If people told those stories about her mother, her mother's spirit would feel it. She'd be haunted, weighted by all those lies. Her spirit would never find any rest. She was already weighted down having a daughter born with roses in her body, a curse that spurred those peddled children to turn on their mothers. Now, because of Miel, because of the roses the Bonner girls wanted, her mother would be blamed, slandered. What worse could Miel bring on her mother's soul? Without even meaning to, she had become everything a rose-cursed daughter was feared to be, a disgrace and burden to her own blood. A breeze came in the screen door, ruffling Miel's skirt. The damp hem brushed the backs of her knees. Streamers of chilled air snaked up her sleeves cooling the wound her roses grew from. They felt solid as ribbons, tethering her to this spot on the Bonner's floor. The sideboard drawer slid shut, the wood rasping against a wooden track. But Miel didn't see the scissors until Ivy was peeling back her sweater sleeve. Tarnish dulled the brass of the blades, the handle rubbed shiny by the oils of the Bonner's hands. It didn't make sense. They thought Miel could give them back whatever they had lost. They didn't understand that the only way to do that would be for Chloe never to have gone away. Chloe was a tree, ripped out of and then planted back into an orchard, her roots and the roots of every tree near her shocked by the turning over of earth. But Miel couldn't move. She was letting them, because they were the Bonner girls, and all of them had their stares on her. Ivy's, her eyes a gray that made the red of her hair look hot as a live coal. Leanne's, a green as deep as her hair was dark red. Chloe's and Peyton's, both their eyes a brown that in certain lights looked dark gray. Because together they had so much shared gravity they pulled toward that navy blue house anything they wanted. Because they were four brilliant red lynxes, and she could not run. Ivy snipped the stem. The cut bit into Miel like thorns waited under her skin. She cried out for just a second before biting back the sound. The feeling came back into her body. Pain snapped away the ribbons of cool air tethering her to the floor. And she ran, holding her wrist against her chest. The stub of a cut stem dripped blood onto her sweater sleeve, like a broken branch of star jasmine letting off milk. She threw the screen door open and let it slam shut. Among the flecks of orange and white in the pumpkin fields were small glints of light, like the field was dark velvet dotted with white opal. Her eyes adjusted, the vines and little points of light sharpening. Glass. The pumpkins were turning to glass. Everything that whirled between the Bonner sisters had not stayed inside that house. It had not huddled inside the sisters' bedrooms. It would not be locked inside their closets or hidden on shelves under their sweaters. It had slid out here, creeping over their family's fields, this land they would inherit. It was seeping into the pumpkins so that each one now held a little storm, spinning it to glass. It made the pumpkins brittle and hard and unyielding as the bond between those four girls. Miel could almost feel it skimming her neck, like fingers of cold air. If she stayed still, 
It would find its way into her. It would make her breakable. It would turn her to glass. Miel ran down the path to the road, keeping as far from those pumpkins as the spread of the land let her. Her sweater clung to her skin, and the scalloped neckline of the shirt she wore underneath bit into her like teeth. The pain in her wrist shot through her body. But she ran, fast enough that she could pretend she didn't see the pumpkins at the fringes of the fields, hardening and turning clear, shining the faint gold of hot glass. Sea of Vapors Sam and his mother had just finished cleaning up from dinner when Araceli called. Can you come help me? She said when Sam picked up. His mother stood at the stove, firing the cast iron pan, the way she dried it so it wouldn't rust. Sam propped the phone against his shoulder and looked over at her, his silent way of asking, Do you mind? They'd held to the unspoken agreement that as long as he asked permission to go out when his mother was awake, she wouldn't comment on the times he snuck out to see Miel when she was asleep. Did you finish your math? His mother mouthed. He nodded. His mother turned off the fire and nodded back. Sure, Sam told Araceli. Good, Araceli said, because I'm about three seconds from strangling your girlfriend. She hung up, leaving Sam to pick apart what little she'd said. The clench in his throat when he wondered if Araceli knew. The breath out when he realized that if she did, she didn't seem to want to kill him. And the question of what had gotten her in a bad enough mood that she was ready to kill Miel. His mother threw a jacket at him. He shrugged into the sleeves on his way out and followed the moons he'd set out for Miel, a path of light between their houses. Miel didn't cure lovesickness herself. She didn't have what she called El Don, the gift Araceli had. But often Miel helped her, passing her matches and glass jars and the right kind of egg. She went out and picked lemons from the tree outside, the gold rinds rain-slicked. Araceli couldn't set these things out beforehand because she never quite knew what she needed until she met the lovesickness living inside a broken heart. Sam walked up the front steps, and like always, the color of the outside made him think of a paint he'd once used. Wisteria, the tube had called it. It had sounded like a place, somewhere that was both beautiful and too small to show on a map. But when he asked his mother, she told him it was a flower, a vine that dripped blossoms like icicles. Araceli met him at the door. Watch her, Araceli said, tilting her head inside. Miel stood with her back against the wall, shoulders rounded. He would have wondered if Araceli had yelled at her, but in front of those who came for lovesickness cures, she never did. Araceli's heels clicked against the floor, Sam and Miel following. What happened? Sam said, keeping his voice low. Miel shook her head. Not now. Tonight, Araceli was curing a man. Sometimes Araceli called Sam over to hand her eggs and herbs and the right kind of lemon. Having a boy around made the men more comfortable. They were already skittish about having Araceli's hands on their chests. Having a girl passing blue eggs to Araceli unnerved them, like the fact that they were two of them made it more likely they were witches. This man looked a little older than Araceli, maybe twenty-eight or thirty. Everything about him seemed so pale against the dark walls of this room, the color of a blue milk mushroom. The waves of his hair, a dark blonde like dried corn, had been cut short. He wore pressed slacks, nice enough for church, and a gray sweater and a knit too heavy for the weather, like he was trying to protect his heart from the thing he was paying to have done to it. Araceli asked for a Favorel egg, and Miel staring at the patch of indigo wall, reached for a copper Moran egg. Sam slipped it from her palm, replacing it with the cream egg Araceli wanted. Araceli asked for a blood orange, and Miel reached for a Lumia lemon. Sam stopped her. So that was the problem. Miel wasn't paying attention. Sorry, Miel whispered. What's going on with you? He asked. She taught him which kind of egg was which. She could usually help Araceli half asleep. 
The only thing Sam was good for was reassuring the men. Araceli cracked the egg into a jar of water. She studied how the yolk spread, in needles like comet trails, or thick full light like a cord of dawn outlining the hills, so she would know how the lovesickness was holding on to them. She swept herbs and a new egg over the man's body, put her hands on his shoulders. She pressed down on his upper rib cage, feeling through his skin. Her hands drew the lovesickness out. Lovesickness resisted leaving, Araceliad told him, always. Whenever Sam watched Araceli, he saw the strain in her face when she drew it out, like pulling a full, heavy bucket up from a well. But this man was no different from any other visitor on Araceli's table. His heart was swollen and sore with unwanted love. It fluttered inside his ribcage like wings. When Araceli took it out, it might flit around the room, running into a cabinet, bothering the apricots in the fruit bowl. But then Miel would fling the window open, and she and Araceli would chase it out the window like a bird that had wandered in. Except tonight, Araceli opened her hands, and Miel forgot to open the window. She stood against the wall, watching the floor. Sam jumped toward the window, pulling the sash up from the sill. He tensed, only relaxing when he didn't hear the unseen lovesickness skimming the walls or knocking against the glass jars. Araceli caught Sam's eye and then nodded between Miel and the door, a look of get her out of here. Miel caught that look and turned to the door before Sam did. She left the indigo room and then the house, stopping at the front steps. Sam caught up with her. I don't know, she said before he could ask. I'm just off today. She shut her eyes and shook her head again. He wanted to touch her. It should have been easy now. But since that night in his bed, he hesitated putting his hands near her, like his fingers and her skin carried the static of the driest days. Once they'd been like glass, and the little shocks, his forearm grazing her breast, or her hand accidentally finding the thigh of his jeans, passed through them. But touching each other that night had turned them to copper. Their bodies would conduct the heat of every little moment. When his arm touched her back, when they were in his mother's kitchen making so on, and they realized that the flame under the sugar and honey was up too high, both reaching at the same time to turn it down. But now she was pulling away, and his own questions felt like threads of spider silk catching on his skin. What version of him did she want? Sam or Samir? Or some boy named Moon that this town had made up? Did she want him because he hadn't grown out of this? Or because she assumed he would? How long could he want her, as Sam, before he grew up and became someone else? Miel, he said. What's wrong? I'm fine, she said. I'm fine. She kissed him. But it was as stiff and uneasy as the first time she'd done it. When they were children, and she set her lips against his for no longer than it took to blink. He could taste the clover and sugar on her lips, like sage honey. It made him think of her licking it off a knife when Araceli wasn't looking. She went inside, and he heard the soft creak of the stairs, and then saw her bedroom lamp turn on. Light filled the window, and she felt as far and unreachable as the moon. Bay of Trust Araceli had tried to make Miel immune. Often, she brought home blue-rinded Jaradale pumpkins and deep orange rouge vif de tomps, and Miel would hide in the hallway closet. Araceli would narrate her progress from the kitchen. I'm splitting it open, Miel. Okay, now I'm hollowing it out. I'm putting it in the pot now. But Miel stayed in the closet, worried that new vines might sprout from the pumpkin's severed stem. That was probably another thing Araceli had almost asked ten times, opening her mouth and then hesitating. Why, to Miel, a pumpkin couldn't just be a pumpkin? A question Araceli knew better than to say out loud. That hesitation always told Miel that the words on Araceli's tongue had more weight than, Are we out of blue eggs? Or have you seen my yellow sweater? 
Miel wondered if a look crossed her face that showed Araceli the threat of fear in her. Please, please don't ask questions. Please don't wreck this, this life I have with you, by making me tell you. Now, standing at the edge of the Bonner's farm, Miel wrapped her arms around herself, fingers digging in. Light from the Bonner's house poured onto the fields, warming the soft gray color of the Lumina pumpkins. The sight of each rind covered Miel in the feeling that it could crush her, that it could put out vines and sink them into her. It would draw the life out of her and grow bigger, and she would become small enough for it to swallow. She was stupid to come here, and she knew it. It was after midnight, hours too late to pretend she'd stopped by to find Sam, or even to lie that she'd come to see Leanne or Peyton. But she had to see the pumpkins. It hadn't been the fever of ivy cutting away her rose. More of the pumpkins had become glass. Constellations of them glinted, each one heavy and shining. The living flesh of a few pumpkins had turned, like flowers freezing into ice. The little storm held between the Bonner sisters had spilled out of their family's house. They were shifting to try to give Chloe back the space she'd held, but they couldn't settle into where they'd been before she left. They still held that shared power of being Bonner girls. It had kept its sharpness, but it was turning into something halting and jagged. And now the fields were showing it. The night air covered Miel. The cold threaded through her, and in the hollow of the wind, she heard the sad murmur of her mother's voice. To everyone else, it would sound like the warning of a storm. But if Miel listened, if she shut her eyes and found that humming under the wind, she heard her mother, caught between this life and leaving it. She could never hear her father. She couldn't even remember if he'd died or if he'd left them. But how could he have left them? Miel held on to the thought of him wrapping a bandage around her wrist, her saying, It's hurting me, when he fastened it too tight, and his calm voice saying it needed to be tight, to heal. His mild dismay when he checked on the wound and found it growing new leaves. His assurances that, don't worry, Miha, we'll get it next time, as though he could will her rose to vanish. Those memories, even if they were laced with the feeling that they were not real, that they belonged to some other girl and Miel had stolen them, were her certainty that her father did not leave them. That left the awful possibility that they'd lost him. It left Miel to guess how to wonder if it was her fault. With each wink of glass the moon found, her mother's song sounded a little sharper, a little more like weak sobbing. Mr. and Mrs. Bonner would notice, and if they asked, their daughters would blame Miel. Chloe and Ivy would tell their mother and father that Miel was not only a girl once made of water, but that she'd had a mother who tried to kill her. The girls half this town thought were witches would call Miel a witch a wicked girl the river had kept and then given back, and who was now turning their fields to glass. The lies in the Bonner girl's hands were a thousand pairs of scissors, brass and tarnished. If they spread that story, her mother's soul would never be free of it. It would follow her, pin its weight to her, and drag her down. Her mother already stayed too close, watching Miel and looking for the brother Miel would never see again. She had to do what Ivy said. She had to wait for her next rose to grow and open, and then she had to let the Bonner sisters have it. The question of why they wanted them pinched at her. It couldn't have been as simple as making boys fall in love with them. They already knew how to do that. Even Chloe, months gone, with the rumors trailing through her hair like ribbons, hadn't lost the shimmer that lived on their skin. That was the worst thing, the not knowing. If them wanting the roses was about any boy in particular, or all of them. If it meant Ivy was set on the boy who'd been so disinterested at the river. Or if one of her sisters had decided on a boy from another town who had never heard of the Bonner girls and would be unprepared for the force of them. Or Sam. That possibility whispered to Miel, too. He worked at their family's farm. No other boy had ever gotten that close to the Bonner girls without wanting them. Miel put her palm to her wrist, the muscle still sore, and the words she hadn't been able to find when Ivy opened those scissors filled her mouth. No, she whispered over those fields. No, you can't have this part of me. 
If they tried to take Sam, she'd do anything she could to stop them. But that choice was his. This one was hers. I am not your garden, she said, the words no louder than the threat of her mother's voice the wind carried. I am not one of your father's pumpkin vines. You do not own what I grow. The wind and the crackling sounds of leaves and vines answered her. Those glints of glass looked a little duller. Instead of their shine, she saw the cream gray of the Estrella pumpkins or the deep blue green of autumn wings. The wind and that thread of her mother's voice quieted. It was the first time the sight of pumpkins, fresh and alive, had warmed her. She stood facing those fields instead of cringing away, and this was as much of a sign as her mother had ever given her. Between them, pumpkins were a language as sharp as it was unknowable to anyone else. If she heard the distant rush of her mother's voice, it was her blessing. Miel wouldn't do it. The next time she had a full rose on her wrist, she was staying far from the Bonner girls. A tired feeling swept over her, equal parts exhaustion and relief. She wanted to sink into it, fall onto her bed with her clothes still on. No matter how the Bonner sisters thought they could threaten her, she wouldn't give in to it. The decision had left her worn out, ready to slip beneath the glow of Sam's moons. She went home to the Violet house and found the light on in the kitchen. Araceli was standing in front of the wall calendar, the belt on her robe tied in a half-hearted bow. Araceli looked over at Miel, eyeing her sweater, her jeans, her lack of a nightgown. What were you doing out? What are you doing up? Miel asked. Trying to remember the last time Emma came in. Araceli studied the calendar. I think we're about due. Emma Owens, the wispy blonde woman who ran the school office, managed to get her heart broken at least once every couple of months. She fell in love with men who didn't call, or men who did call and who she scared off with her gratitude and hurry. In her early thirties, hell-bent on getting married before thirty-five, she ended up sobbing on Araceli's table at least once a season. Every time she set her hands on her ribcage, Araceli told Mrs. Owens to slow down that the right heart would find hers, but only when both hearts were ready. But every time Araceli cured her, rid her of wanting whatever regional produce buyer or accountant did not want her back, she was barely off the table by the time she had another date with another man who would drift between interested and indifferent. Even in her prim, pearl-buttoned cardigans, she was pretty and white-blonde-haired enough that she was rarely alone on a Friday night. Miel stood next to Araceli. Don't you worry about how often she comes in? First rule of business, never argue with a repeat customer, Araceli said. Besides, I know what I'm doing. One day you're going to pull her whole heart right out of her. Oh, I'd love to explain that, Araceli said. Miel extended a hand in front of her like she was setting a headline. Curandera accidentally kills local woman. Screw accidentally, Araceli said. They'd never believe it. A correction to Monday's front page, Miel said. Bruja did it on purpose. Araceli clicked her tongue and shook her head, like the women gossiping at the market. Tore that poor woman's heart straight out of her body. Miel looked at Araceli. You know my ancestors could do that in under 15 seconds, right? Araceli held out her hands in front of her. Not with this manicure. Miel felt the air settling between them, Araceli letting fall her irritation over needing to call Sam. I'm sorry, Miel said. About before. It won't happen again. Araceli nodded, as much at the calendar as at Miel. I know. Lake of Death Araceli washed out a blue glass jar, the inside milky from when she'd used it during a lovesickness cure. The mix of water and egg always resisted coming clean. Miel was at the yellow kitchen table, making a stack of books she needed and another of books she didn't. She felt Araceli watching her, even as she scrubbed the glass. You're gonna go study? Araceli asked, in a voice she must have meant to be joking. 
but it made Miel blush more than laugh. Araceli had caught on to what she was doing when she put her books into her bag each afternoon, the class assignment she'd read while she waited for Sam. You just make sure you let him get his work done, Araceli said. He's got his hands full finding enough pumpkins to cut. What are you talking about? Miel asked. The glass. Araceli set the jar on the drying rack. It's spreading. Now, when he's cutting fruit off the vine, he has to make sure he's not breaking anything. Miel could imagine him like that, stepping through the fields, feeling for rough living stems instead of glass. He would look like a cat crossing a crowded shelf without knocking anything over. But the thought of those glints in the fields still felt like a chill along Miel's ribs. Of course Mr. Bonner would have his farmhands continue as though nothing had changed. Of course he would ignore all that glass, pretending it wasn't there. It was the way he treated the force that was his daughters, as though they were still young girls settling ribbon headbands into one another's hair. What? Araceli asked, her eyes going over Miel's face. You know something about it? No, Miel said, a little too fast. But whatever was happening between the Bonner sisters, however their land felt it and reflected it back, was neither Miel's business to question nor her responsibility to explain. Sam was the one thing that could get Miel close to the Bonner's farm, but she didn't let the sisters see her, especially not now, a week later, when she'd grown and drowned a white rose with petals tipped in faint green. Last night, the petals had spread wide, showing her the breath of yellow at the center, so she'd cut the stem and let the river take it. In moments of lying to herself, she told herself it was just Sam, just that she wanted to see him and touch where the sweat off the back of his neck had left his hair a little damp. She wanted to kiss him when his mouth was still wet from having just taken a swallow of water. And that was true. But in moments of letting the rest of the truth edge into her, she knew she wanted the Bonner sisters to see her, wanted them to catch her pulling Sam into the woods, kissing him before they even reached the tree's shadows. She wanted them to see her bare wrist and know that just because they were the Bonner girls, just because they'd gotten Hunter Cross and Jerome Carter and every other boy they wanted, didn't mean she'd turn over to them the things her body grew. If they thought they needed her roses, they had lost something. That left Miel less afraid of them knowing she wanted Sam, and more intent on them knowing he did not belong to them. He belonged to himself, and to his mother, and maybe even to Miel, but not to them. He wasn't theirs any more than Miel's roses were. Today, she caught Sam at the edge of the pumpkin fields, pulled him under a sycamore big enough to hide them both. For a few minutes, before he went back to work and she left to finish her reading or pick up eggs from the Carlson's farm, this canopy of leaves, orange and gold at the edges but still green at its heart, was their whole world. She backed him against the bark, kissing him hard enough that it stung. Her hand brushed his chest, and without her realizing, she spread it flat, fingers fanned out against his shirt. She only noticed when he shuddered, his shoulders pressing back harder against the tree. Sorry, she said, her mouth still near his. Sorry. They both stayed still, taking in a long breath of air that was wet and earthy with fall but sharp from the smoke of farmers' burning leaves. Miel told her palm to move. She tried to send the impulse to her fingers to pull away from him. She knew so much of his body, but this was a place she hadn't touched. His chest had been against her when they were in his bed, but she hadn't mapped it with her hands. Even with the undershirt that pressed it down, and through a shirt made his chest flat as any other boy's, she never put her hands here, not even poking a finger just under his collarbone when she teased him or flirted with him. It was a part of his body he didn't like being reminded of, and she understood now that her hands were the worst kind of reminder. She checked his watch for him, always checked his watch for him, because she knew he didn't like telling her he had to get back. You're late, she said. He kissed her again, hard, and it felt like him telling her that they could forget this. He would forgive her, not even forgive her. He would let it go, treat it like the accident it was, like him holding her in a way that pressed the edge of his belt buckle into her, or her, without meaning to, when she put her hand to the side of his neck, scratching him. When he left, she leaned against the tree, hands flat on the bark behind the small of her back, 
and watched him. To her, he had always been Sam, the boy who made the moon for her, the boy whose silhouette she'd found a hundred times on that wooden ladder, light filling his hands. That didn't change when she saw him, through the bedroom door he thought he'd closed, but with a latch that sometimes sighed open, changing his clothes or getting dressed after taking a shower. It was only then that she saw that part of him he bound down with that undershirt. Or his hips, a little wider in a way that didn't show through jeans, but she could see when he had on just his boxers. None of it had been a surprise. She knew what he was. The tension in the fact that, to anyone who didn't understand, there was contradiction between how he lived and what he had under his clothes. How he had to wear pants loose enough that no one noticed what he did or did not have. His face was softer than the other boys in their class, but his work on the Bonner's farm had added enough muscle to his back and shoulders that he looked a little broader than before. Boys at school had almost stopped calling him a girl, a thing they meant as something else, a thing they said without knowing what they were saying. From what little Miel knew, from what little his mother had been willing to say, this was something Sam thought he would grow out of. He didn't seem to realize he was growing into it. Miel walked alongside the road, the points of wet fallen leaves brushing her ankles. A swath of copper swept out of the woods, like a whole branch of leaves breaking loose. Ivy Bonner stood, watching her. I want to show you something, she said. No greeting, no introduction, not even a glare from Miel's bare wrist. Miel could have kept walking, but ignoring her would have felt like provocation. Keeping quiet, not telling her no, had cost her that candle yellow rose. What? Miel asked. If I could tell you about it, I wouldn't need to show you. Ivy said it like it was a secret shared with a child, not with the allure, the tilt of her neck that the Bonner sisters liked showing both boys and other girls. Miel looked over her shoulder at the road, but running again felt like both an admission that she was afraid and a kind of escalation. Will you relax? Ivy said. I'm not mad. You're not? Miel asked, hating the deference in her own voice. I don't get mad, Ivy said. Nobody should. What does that do? She sounded like Sam's mother, and Miel wondered if she'd picked it up from her. Even the Bonner girls must have appreciated the glamour of Yasmin's pressed white shirts, her thick eyeliner, and jewelry made of oversized quartz and jasper. She'd tutored the Bonner girls a few times, not every week the way she did with the children of so many families, but when Mrs. Bonner had a bad cold and they fell behind on their lesson plans. You're mad, though, Ivy said. No, I'm not, Miel said. Yes, you are. You feel like I took something from you without giving you anything. The thought of the tarnished scissors in Ivy's hands made Miel clutch her forearm. It wasn't about Ivy not giving her anything. It was about her and her sisters keeping their stares on her, the numbing spell of those eight eyes, so she didn't realize what they were taking until the snap of those brass blades. That's why I want to show you something no one else gets to see, Ivy said. Something I haven't shown anyone. A flickering in Miel's ribcage told her to run. But another current inside her pushed her toward following Ivy. Both because she was a little curious, and because when a Bonner girl offered a secret, it seemed foolish and antagonistic to refuse it. Once, Leanne Bonner had a birthday party one of the few the Bonner girls had invited anyone but family to. Leanne heard Elise Shanholt calling the girls creepy, saying she wouldn't come within a mile of that house, wouldn't go to that party even if Nate Stewart's hot older brother wanted her to be his date to it. So Ivy and Peyton had stolen her cat, a beautiful orange tabby as big as a raccoon. They petted it, gave it cream they skimmed themselves, laughed when a dose of catnip made it bat at its own tail, it didn't take long before Elise discovered who'd taken it. But when she came to get it, it wailed and clawed and wouldn't go with her. It ran from her, circling Ivy's legs and then jumping into Leanne's lap. Elise's parents said they'd get her another cat, told her to look weren't the girls taking good care of it, and it wasn't their fault if it had taken to them. Miel remembered Elise crying in the halls for a week over that. Even her parents had taken the Bonner girl's side. And that cat roamed the Bonner's farm until it died last spring, 
always running back to the girls who'd stolen it. For Miel to refuse Ivy's gift, to turn her back now, would be a declaration of war. The girl from the Violet House against the sisters who lived in the Navy one. So, she went with Ivy. The deeper they walked into those gold and orange woods, the more she flitted between fear and excitement. That was the thrill of the Bonner sisters, she guessed, to the boys who loved them, that they never knew in which parts to be elated and terrified. Their time being loved by a Bonner girl might be short and sudden as a firework, or long and spun out, and they never knew which. The letdown would be either soft or brutal, and they never knew which. Only a few columns of light pierced the trees, but this time of year the trees were their own light, amber and coral and butter-colored. Ivy stopped in a grove that was almost all yellow, the flat gold of cottonwood and birch and tulip poplar. A large box, long and wide as a florist's case or a coffin, sat on the ground, its sides and lid and even its floor made of stained glass. It had been laid down, on the base where a body would rest flat, as though at any moment the whole box might sink into the ground and become a grave. Whirls of deep red and violet crossed the panels. Sprays of milky stars floated over a field of dark blue and green. Even the long cracks slicing the planets and constellations didn't make it less beautiful. So it's true, Miel said. Half true, Ivy said. It doesn't make us pretty, if that's what you're wondering. Miel wondered how long it had been here where the Bonner girls, whichever generation of them, had gotten the stained glass, Miel would never know. Maybe they had bought it, bartered for it, or stolen it. Not that the Bonner women ever needed to steal anything themselves. From what Miel had heard, sets of beautiful sisters glittered through this family like flecks of mica in sand. It made Mr. Bonner as terrified of his daughters as he'd been of his sisters and aunts, and Mrs. Bonner, baffled by her husband's family, all those flame-haired women. All they would have needed to do was lower the soft screen of their red-gold eyelashes to get men to tear the bright glass panels from the windows of their own church. With flashes of their cream-white shoulders, they could have gotten those same men to hand over the stained glass like boxes of violet candy. Miel imagined them flirting with metalsmiths, who would have charged them nothing to join the loose panels into this box and trim the corners and edges in rose brass. It got covered over for a few years, Ivy said. Vines and leaves practically buried the thing. She made a half circle around the stained glass, and Miel felt the unease of thinking that somehow, if there were smudges or fingerprints, Ivy would hold her responsible. My parents didn't want us to know about it. They pretended the whole thing was a rumor, but we found it. When Ivy said something she hadn't shown anyone, she'd meant anyone except her sisters. It hadn't so much been a lie. The Bonner girls were as linked as cells in a single organism, breathing together, as the fact of Ivy keeping no secrets from her sisters was implied. Well, Chloe and I found it, Ivy said, but we all cleaned it up. Why? Miel asked. Ivy stopped, her face scrunching into a smile like Miel was slow. Because it's ours, she said. Everyone should take care of what's theirs. Miel caught the movement of two shadows. She couldn't make out their shapes yet. She just sensed them passing under the trees, like the minute before she and Sam had seen the lynx. I'm surprised you don't know already, Ivy said. Miel turned her back to Ivy. Know what? That things go easier when you just give people what they want. Miel felt that pair of shadows drawing closer. The second she looked toward the trees again, Ivy grabbed her. Miel tried to wrench away from her hold, but Ivy's fingers were hot on her wrists. When she grabbed the place Miel had just trimmed a rose from, pain spun through her arm. Miel tried to twist away from her, but then everything was orange and red. Not just Ivy, but Leanne's loose auburn hair and the muted orange of Peyton's curls. And when their hands all fell on her, she knew it was true. That they were one animal in many bodies. When one set of fingers lost its grip, another tightened. When Miel threw her weight against one of them, another pulled her back so the force dissipated and did not land. Ivy pushed the lid of the stained glass coffin open, and they forced Miel in. Miel's knees hit first, the impact reverberating up to her wrist. 
she collapsed on her side and all those hands shoved her limbs within its walls so ivy could throw the lid shut miel turned holding her hands up to stop it from closing the weight drove her down and the sound of a latch clicking echoed through the glass she pushed up on the lid it did not move she shoved her weight against the panel it stayed in place sealed shut that latch would not open from the inside she banged on the lid the walls barely gave her enough room to twist her body she tried to throw her shoulder at the side and then the lid she tried to shove her weight against the panels aiming for the places where long cracks cut through the patterns but the cracks even the long ones were shallow and didn't give and she was trapped like a moth in a killing jar only the cold wisp of a few holes in the glass let her breathe movement outside the glass made her turn her head the bright fall trees and the color of the stained glass blurred her view but she thought she made out ivy's copper hair vanishing peyton and leanne stayed the orange and auburn of their hair still they left their pale arms loose by their sides standing guard miel tried to scream but there was so little air in here that the heat and the walls stole the sound from her throat she tried to grab onto something that would let her breathe the smell of sam's skin and hair the way araceli had just painted her nails with plum polish and tipped them in silver or how she put on her alexandrite bracelet sparkling like the soft purple of hydrangeas the roof tiles on sam's house varied like kernels on an ear of glass gem corn slate blue and deep yellow dull rose and dusk violet she thought of the rows of flat stones set in the grass that led to the door of sam's house but she could only smell the salt on her own damp skin thinking of araceli's nails or those roof tiles made her think of the colors of all this stained glass she was losing her breath to it it was taking her under